This is capitalism's trump card. It encourages creativity and empathy and puts them at the service of the wants and the needs of the people. The inequality the socialist left despises isn't created by the entrepreneur. It's created by us. The proud boast of democratic socialism is that it puts the people in charge of the economy. What control do you have over the post office or the DMV? We vote in elections every two or four years, but as consumers, we exercise our choices daily directly through the market. The free market is far more reflective of popular consent than democratic socialism. We don't have to extend democracy from the political to the economic sphere because in many ways we already have it. Capitalism, not socialism, is the true form of social justice. Welcome to Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone today. We have Michael Tassarion. He is an independent researcher, teacher, filmmaker. Check out his excellent film, Architects of Control. You'll see three links to his website as well as that movie in the links in the description. Mr. Tassarion, thank you for for your time, sir. Yeah, thank you, Keith. It's uh, nice to be on with you. Looking forward to this. Uh, what is freedom? Well, that's an interesting thing. That my approach is always that it's uh, never given to us politically. It's always something that uh, is first given unto ourselves by ourselves. You know, so that sort of changes gear and takes us into more of a, hey, not just a psychological iteration, but maybe even a philo you know a philosophical iteration. So it's a combination of those things. And then the kind of freedom that we might find as a citizen of a culture or a, a country, that then is a you know a derivative of that. So the real thing is something that you give yourself. You know, Ayn Rand uh, talked about, she's one of my big mentors, spoke about a thing called psychoepistemology. There's an ugly term for you. But when broken down, it's actually a very beautiful thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the, for her, the rational man, the man who's in true contact with reality knows that he has a mind, obviously, that's given unto us that we are self-reflexive enough to know we've got a consciousness and got a mind. But uh, as far as she was concerned, not everybody values the existence and presence of mind or thought. We just think, we just do. And she, she, she noticed some of the beauty of her work is that she noticed, and this would apply very much to socialists as well, by the way, uh, she would she would notice that certain people actually, if you just peel off the surface, they actually don't value their minds and consciousness. You won't see that unless you look very closely. But her philosophy is grounded in it that the psychoepistemology of psycho is mind, is the ability to think and have consciousness. But yeah, that's the mechanical aspect behind all the thinking and the doing and the, and the acting and the emotions and, and the reason. Is there actually a, an epistemology there where you value that you are that kind of being? And as far as she was concerned, no, there's not. So her man, her masculine, you know, sort of archetype was somebody who not only thinks like everybody else, but it's already coming from a comportment of valuation and respect and, and a kind of a gratitude, you know, for the act of thinking. Now, she's not the only one there. That, that, that can be found in other philosophers, too. But it's vital. I don't care who the philosopher is, right wing, left wing, in the middle. This is vital. And she brought it to the fore more so that it would be crucial because it had lapsed. Other people who had spoken this way didn't speak enough. It was implicit in their philosophy, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, writ large. In Ayn Rand, it is writ large. And then that's what makes sense then of future comments that she has about reason, the rational man, trusting in your reason and all that. But it's all based in the psychoepistemology. And that's where I look then for, to answer questions like that about freedom. The stuff that's given to, you, you know, down the line by, uh, you know, a king, a warlord, a governor, a, a political party can be taken away just as quickly. You can find yourself in the dungeon, you know, uh, uh, at one point, or you can find yourself, you know, in, in a quite uh, libertarian uh, world. But that can change in a heartbeat. Is that is that where you put your freedom? Merely in a political context or sphere? Not good enough, says Rand. You know, you have to be able to attribute it to yourself and with that comes a value of freedom and a value of the thinking process, which is rooted in freedom. And uh, what is socialism and why do you oppose socialism? Well, I think that uh, that is because socialism is just a catchphrase, really. It's a very useless term. You know, the Nazis have used it. The communists have used it. Uh, you know, Swedish Democrats, you know, and you will use it even on occasion. It's, it's just a sociological term. But unfortunately, when you start to unpack it, the short answer is that it's really a kind of collectivism. And then uh, this is a, a collectivism 
is still okay. It's only collectivism in the extreme sense of when anything collective, right, starts to exist because it's based in the erasure of a kind of the selfhood that we spoke about just a minute ago. And this, of course, can be proven. Even a socialist can see that they uh, don't value their own minds. They value what the, the herd thinks or what the leader thinks, right, or what the, I've been taught in school. And if you study the life of a socialist, you will find that there's almost no independent thinking there at all. It's, it's uh, and also no valuation underneath it, the more important aspect, because it's not that conservatives can't go wrong in their thinking, of course they do. It's not that, you know, the, the liberal guy, you know, who's, I'm just, you know, trying to do as much good as I can in the world. Yeah, his thinking can go wrong as well. I, I've known people who are, you know, you're, you're sort of camera eye communists. You're sort of a flag waving socialist where they're brutes at home. They, they tell on the, uh, in public, they want to talk about how wonderfully socialist the world should be. And then they're beating their wives and kids you know, mercilessly uh, when the door is closed. I've seen teachers like that, you know. So the socialist is really one who's abnegated the kind of things we've already addressed. Abnegated value, abnegated reason, abnegated individualism. And there are such people. And when they gather together, they create societies. Uh, it's not that I'm against liberalism. In the, uh, liberalism in the British sort of, you know, context is... That's, that's nothing wrong with that at all. If that was all we had to deal with, we'd be really with some very logical and, and well-meaning humanitarian people. You know, the socialism, as we've known it, in most of its uh, darker iterations, is, is very far from that. You know. What are Western values? Well, that's, that's uh, really a story of ancient history, actually, right? Because um, although there's been great liberal movements in what we would call the Age of Enlightenment and all the rest of it. I really think myself, and I could be wrong here, but because there's a great argument here, but I think that they start way back in time. I think they, they start when we were tribal, you know, really. And uh, that the ones that we see in a more sort of urbanized en environment are just kind of um, later iterations, you know, uh, and you pass through Thomas Hobbes. And you pass through Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, so there's a lot of modifications as we move up to now. But the real values are something that is set in Anglo-Saxon consciousness, which is the, the value of independence. Because if you actually go back and study other groups that are not, uh, you know, Western, you won't find that. You still don't find it, right? Or you only find a sort of a veneer of, of feeling of independence. Uh, people are much more likely, say, in Eastern climes and Middle Eastern climes to, th to not be able to think outside the box to sacrifice themselves for family, you know, uh, uh, and I mean, uh, dutifully, like a servile creature. And also their tendency, you know, and I have also studied this, so I feel that the Anglo-Saxon, the spirit, let's put it this way, the spirit or the consciousness of the Anglo-Saxon mind and the Western mind is more motivated by the question of individualism. It comes to bear. Now, it's got highly contaminated. It is by no means a pure, you know, phenomena. But at least in the West, you know, there has been that question of independence as an individual, as apart from his collective. Now, it's got sullied endlessly. Every time it sort of popped its head up, you know, it, it immediately got uh, dethroned or immediately got contaminated, uh, you know, with the various Christian groups or, you know, the Puritans or, the, the you know, the sort of... Um, uh, the kind of puritanicalness of these different groups. And you also find it in, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. All sorts of these groups, again, sort of a disfavor individualism and independence. And, you know, again, created a very sort of collectivistic model. Uh, and we're still fighting it today, as far as I'm concerned. So those values are there, but I still think it, it's early days because of this lack of psychoepistemology. Why, what, what would be the point of even a very high civilization trying to in, teach you or instill in you something that isn't natural to yourself, right? So when all the all structures are collectivistic, how can we expect a young man or you know, young girl, young boy, or somebody even in college to develop the level of individualism we're talking about right now? So you know, it becomes a lot of window dressing that a society can put on. We're independent, we're free, we're capitalistic, we're this. But if you dig down deep, you don't actually find any of that at all. This is This is one of the dangers, I think. Now, Vladimir Putin was very critical of individualism, saying the Americans or individualist ideologies care about one person. 
individual one themselves. So it's selfish. We believe in collectivism, which is much more caring. Now, my understanding is that the individualist sees a million people and says that is a million individuals with a, a million different ends who all deserve to be treated respectively. Whereas the collectivist sees them as one blob. If we have to kill some to save others, well, then we're just doing the well-being of the group. How would you respond to the uh, Putin mindset of uh, the individual is morally, the individual list is morally inferior because it's selfish. Yeah, well, first of all, I wouldn't debate with anyone. Um, I would chat like we're doing right now. Uh, it's sort of <laughs> yeah. off the point. I wouldn't yeah. sit down with any of these people. Uh, to me, they're so far gone that argument is just wasted on them, right? Because socialism, if you dig down deep, it is really an infection. It's an aberration of consciousness on the absolute uh, basic level. You know, what, what some psychologists would call semiotic, I mean, pre-conscious. So there's no way outside of actual coercion that you'd fix them. And then we have to go, do I want to be a coercive kind of person? When you go, no. So you then the best thing, freedom means freedom, leave them to themselves. But as long as they don't violate the, you know, the rights of others. But we see we're, but then you deal with the psychology of the drip feed. They have drip fed the society. So society doesn't have any combatancy against these aberrant ideas because we loathe ideas, right? This is the crazy thing. There's a lot of this infection. That's why socialism as an entity even rose at all. It rose in the West. It didn't rise in the East. It, it parallels Eastern collect collectivism, but it rose as a phenomena in the West. And uh, although they have great champions to fight it, unfortunately, it's gained ground over the years. And that's a, an incredible story how that happened. But to your point, they they uh, are very cunning at trying to uh, demonize. You know what, what we talk about when we mean individualism. Those who espouse individualism, including Rand and others, never <clears throat> excuse me, never doubt that what we call self is self in participation. Right. So already the collectivist is uh, shorthanding us. Everything's in sound bites, so their agents dominate the media, you know, dominate. So, so anyone that calls themselves a socialist usually is fairly lowbrow, right? I've always believed that their socialistic uh, as a philosophy or whatever you might call it is really pretty much threadbare. It, it doesn't hold up. It only holds up in these sound bites or if you have an inadequate, you know, uh, 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 counter voice. And even when you've got a very adequate counter voice in the form of just say something like Milo or something like Jordan Peterson, whoever, uh, I mean him in all small caps actually. Um, but then they don't give that person the time and there's all sorts of other techniques to you know, silence that person. But when you cut all away that stuff uh, and you see the chicanery that they never really let you speak, this thing is resolved very, very quickly. All of these espousers of socialism misinterpret or misrepresent uh, the case. Ayn Rand and, 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 and anyone we could talk about who's a espouser right, of individualism obviously is speaking about man in participation with others and man in participation with civilization. Uh, Mitwelt is, is the German word, right? And you are so uh, you know entwined and entangled with Mitwelt that it's actually ludicrous ever to speak except in pure theory of a self as a, as a completely distinct object, uh, objective being. And then if you started to do, say you had a mishandling of the thing and you started to do that, uh, that doesn't lead anywhere because you'll end up in a Cartesian paradox in which that argument now becomes that man, you know, in the Cartesian way is completely separate utterly from ob ob what's called objectified reality, that other people and entities are now completely objectified. And you can easily turn around and say, well, there's Ayn Rand's philosophy, you should call it objectivism, right, or whatever. No. See, immediately things become very, very uh, false there. By no means did, did people like Rand mean that you are this Cartesian entity sitting above uh, as a spectator into any kind of you know, world that's extended from you, but separate from you. <clears throat> that, that, excuse me, that's, that's absolutely false. Um, she took for granted the embedded, embeddedness in culture, that man is embedded in culture. So right off the bat, you see, the socialist is going to try and tell you that you're some imperious you know, present you as some person who empirically is speaking about this mysterious ontological self as if it, there is some sort of, you know, um, such entity. 
when in fact that is not the case. So that's how I would go at it. I would never sit down politically with them to discuss that on the political front. I would have to bring in the philosophy of subjecthood, selfhood, em em empathic reson resonance, which is the things that bring about a society or a culture. So uh, my next question is sort of similar. I'm not necessarily uh, asking if you were debating, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to be my example, but how you would communicate to the mindset of a well-meaning person who might say something like this. So Neil deGrasse Tyson is on the Jim and Sam show, and he said, don't get me wrong, the government's always up to something. The government's always trying to keep a secret. The question is, well, they succeed in keeping the secret of, you know, stockpiling it. Look at how much we know about President Clinton's genitalia. If there was ever a state secret, it would have been what he does with, you know, where he puts it. So I'm curious how you would respond to the mindset of what maybe there are some conspiracies, but even the deepest ones, like between Clinton and Lewinsky, we find out about them. How would you respond to that? Oh, it's true to your point. Yes, the, there are plenty of watchdog groups. There's plenty of investigative journalists out there. So absolutely, there's even, you know, the regular media. So, of course, what a person does, uh, but it you know, will, will often come to light. And some of them are very blasé, like Clinton in the White House. These are egomaniacal psychopaths who've left a trail of disaster, you know, from Mena, Arkansas onwards. Um, you know, over 45 deaths, etc. So, of course, some of the blasé ones, it's, you know, and then they have falling outs within themselves and somebody goes and blows the whistle. We have that right now happening. So you have that every year and you have criminal investigation and you have brilliant investigative journalists. But again, it's selective to that point that there's, it, that doesn't mean then that other more sinister conspiracies, you know, like the presence of deep state or whatever it might be, um, uh, uh, you know, or some a phenomenon like say Islamo-communism, right, which I actually deal with a lot, that anyone knows the rudiments of that. In fact, even when it comes to the Puritan groups we mentioned earlier, you know, at the time of the 1700s, 17th century, you know, does anybody really know about, you know, how blood soaked those groups groups are, you know, or say, you know, the, the Mormon prophet, or, you know, that's, that, that you're dealing with a gang, a, mur a murderous gang in the same way of a, ma a mafia. They played. I don't know why you wouldn't know that. So then you meet with cognitive dissonance. So conspiracy theory suddenly becomes you know, more conspiracy stroke psychology theory because you're dealing with cognitive dissonance. You're not dealing with the fact that the evidence isn't there. You're dealing with the fact that it is there, but nobody wants to look behind that veil. And, you know, I think that is a huge, huge aspect. And it comes with the whole idea of not really being in contact with reality, being in contact with an idea of reality. It all ties together, right? And so this disconnect that even if you brought up something quite mild, right, like British Army collusion with the provisional IRA, completely documented, the top generals of the British Army have written it in their memoirs, did it get abroad? You know, that these Jerry Adams and all are not what they appear to be? No, no, everybody just, you know. So even a, that, even a one that you think would be quite palatable and would explain a lot. No, not even the victims of groups like the provisional IRA are, are willing, oh my God, we've got a key piece here because of the fear of being a conspiracy theorist, right? So you see, you, you, it's something you have to take the deep plunge into. And there's a risk, you can, you, come back, you can come back crazy like so many people in this movement, you know, who call themselves conspiracy theorists, it's hard to stay rational. But at the same time, I think it's always worth it. I think it's worth it to look behind the veil and, and you know, uh, be able to deal with truth, that there, there is truth out there. You know, truth about AIDS, how that got created, or uh, wars that may have happened you know, throughout history. Uh, and uh, I don't, I've never seen a problem as why you would not want to know the etiology of things like that. You know, I, I don't even think of myself as a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. I just, I'm an interested person who's got a, you know, a high uh, interest in, in uh, history, you know, perhaps a little bit of the obscure material, whatever, you know, but it's, it's never been outside just an intellectual study, actually. In the last chapter of Virtue of Selfishness, Ayn Rand has a chapter called The Argument from Intimidation, where it's just you just disapprove of someone. And that's and that's in exchange of an argument. It's not anything assisting intellectual uh, exchange. So it, it is the perfect example when you go, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, uh, OK, I, I mean, it, that's not an actual response. It's sort of like mm. you wouldn't want to think 
that spouses are most likely the culprit in a crime where the other spouse dies or is killed or is killed mysteriously. But that's just the reality when you look into criminology. And when you look Mm. into history, it's just a story of some groups conspiring at the cost of others. Now, I mean, America is founded on a conspiracy to violently overthrow the government. Even the official story is like a conspiracy. Uh, What are some proven conspiracies that you would point to to just show, show someone, hey, here is an actual example of something that's happened. So don't tell me this doesn't happen. Oh, there's so many. This is the most extraordinary thing from, uh, you know, somebody can take it from a, 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 a almost a, a banal or, uh, you know, Elvis was seen alive. Paul McCartney is really dead. The real, you know, you, you can go from that level, which is your National Enquirer level, mildly interesting, you know, up until much grander, you know, to the top level, like the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and everything in between, you know, the killing of the Tsar and his family, you know, um, and, and and all, of, you know, all the, all the different, uh, uh, all of the different ones that say accused Jesuits or accused Masons, right? And, and you can, so you, there's any way to come at this. You can come in from a, a really extreme right-wing Catholic version, you know, like uh, Father Cochrane did and, Father, uh, what's his name? Oh, uh, yeah, can't remember right now. Another father who wrote uh, several actually really good books exposing what he considered, you know, the conspiracy, right? And then you can come in from the, the Jewish side or you can come in from the Masonic side. So there's all sorts of conspiracies and each one needs to be taken independently. Excuse me. You know, like I was saying about the IRA. You can just take, uh, and groups like that, you can just say, they founded together, they became active in 1979, let off a lot of bombs in Ireland, caused a lot of havoc and killed a lot of people. Or you can say, no, this is a secret society. Originally it was called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, a branch of, say, the ancient order of Hibernians. Well, who, who are they when they're home? And then, you know, the whole thing about the Molly Maguires and, you know, the cover organizations for these groups. And before you know it, you're in the conspiracy. Right. And, and so there's many ways of coming at it. But each case, you know, so one. So you ask for an example. I would say let's look at the leaders of the, you know, Irish socialistic groups like your Eamon de Valera. Just start right there. Or somebody like uh, Sir, Sir Roger Casement, you know, the big names, you know, the ones who were motivated to uh, bring in guns, bring in weapons. Start there. That's where I started. That will lead you in, in various other directions sometimes in the ancient Irish history, sometimes just into the symbolism that they're using. Ask yourself, you know, uh, why, uh, uh, where this order came from, why was it called a brotherhood? That's very Masonic sounding. The Sinn Féin origins, right? That looks very Masonic. And and so you just go step by step by step. And I believe the evidence is already there. The evidence is already there. It's not propaganda created by anybody. It's documented fact that these groups are very, very interesting. And then, you you know, you compare. Why did Mahatma Gandhi, one of the greatest rebel leaders in the world, say that when you fight against, you know, an oppressor, you cannot take anything from that oppressor? That's why he went around in in, 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 in a loincloth and what's called a dhoti, right, which was hand-spun cotton. That's why they made their own salt from the sea, right? They went down to the sea and they made their own salt. And the premise was repeated again and again by this leader, uh, not that I agree with everything Mahatma Gandhi said. I'm just illustrating something here, and that is that if you're gonna if you're gonna throw off an oppressor, then you can't with one hand say I, I'm against you, and with the other hand be taking foodstuffs uh, or anything else from you. Well, let's compare that to the mighty leaders of the IRA, all of whom were on the British dole, all of whom were taking national assistance, all who didn't live in the south but lived in the north where the assistance was forthcoming. Whereas if they lived in the south, they'd be penny penniless. Wow, that's very, very interesting, isn't it? Suddenly these wonderful leaders, you know, uh, 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 with one hand telling you that they're against the British army, the royal family, and all of the sundry, but their wives and their households are receiving checks from that same government. See, some, most, most of the people would just reject that and not think about that or give that a thought. I, on the other hand, find that extremely fascinating and interesting because it makes me feel that there's duplicity in the, the minds of those leaders. Right. I'm not convinced anymore that these are real people's champions. I certainly wouldn't want to follow them. And then when you find out that they're nothing but mass murderers, you know, I think that would add a bit too. Right. So it's just about the kind of mind. But it's the same thing with everything. You know, if Elvis is meant to be alive, let's let's go and, you know, 
check out if you use this credit card or what at the ATMs or whatever, you know, so you, you immediately start going and you do what is needed. You know, in every single case, it starts off small and then suddenly you've got a big elephant in the room, you know. And then if you want to go on and talk to the public and alert them to that, that's a whole other journey right there. Because I believe there's many conspiracy theorists and people who studied very deeply, but they haven't written books about it. Or they've been hesitant. You know, people like Greg Hallett would be a good example there. He finally did write a book, but you can tell it was very, very hesitant. You know, maybe because he didn't have the forte or he wasn't really that inclined or it was a personal study. So there can be conspiracy theorists who know what they know and they write anonymously or they even come on YouTube with a sort of a handle. You don't see their faces, whatever it might be, you know, or they just don't publish at all. And then there's this whole other wing of this, a whole other compo component of this, where you have made a career of going, shaking people by the you know shoulders and going, you've got to listen to this, you've got to listen to that. So there's really two different kinds of conspiracy theorists, actually. Yeah, and then it, I love when people sort of stumble on accidentally. They'll be like, huh, um, you know, it's interesting. The official Benghazi story is a lie. And actually, they were sending weapons to Turkey. And actually, they were funding uh, Islamists to overthrow Assad in Syria with those weapons. Isn't that odd? Isn't that weird? It's like, well, no, they've been funding the Mujahideen since Reagan and Carter in the 80s. They did it in Bosnia. Now they're doing it in Syria and uh, Libya. So even when like it's right in front of your face, people still are like, well, but you can't like say that there's bad motives behind it. Uh, that uh, it's, it's still hard to get into uh, that uh, mindset. Any final thoughts on uh, g uh, the mind of you know conspiracy theorizing or why you think it is the proper way to analyze uh, many situations in the world? Well, I think that came out of inevitability because if you look at the world system, it's been it's been made. Maybe it is complex, but it's been made it's been made extra complex in the way that's presented duplicity by teachers and other encyclopedists or, or pundits or whatever. And so it's sort of a little bit carry on what I just said. If you doubt a, a talking head, say you see them every night, Ted Koppel, you know, Walter Cronkite, you know, you, the, the British versions of such and such, and suddenly you keep finding that they're catching them in lies. There's just one answer to your question. And then you find out further, he's a member of this weird, what's it called, you know, the Bohemian Society, what's that? You know, and then or or or, or, or Masonic Royal Arch Masonry or Scottish Rite Masonry, and you find this out because you picked up a book one day and it said that your faith in that Bob Geldof or in this Bono creature, right? Or or like I said, one of these more familiar talking heads, you have just had your perception of of that person shattered as a teacher or as a you know a, a, a pundit, somebody that can be trusted now. And so I think that 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 creates a disenchantment with. Right, that, that breaks down your trust. And should you find that out later on, say from a figure as, uh, you know, as auspicious as, say, Winston Churchill, that his books are full of lies, his history of the world is nonsense, or a Bertrand Russell or an H.G. Wells or somebody else that you held in great esteem, right? I think that this uh, then, you know, causes such a rut, right, that automatically you need to prop it up by sort of what we're calling the conspiratorial, you know, view of life. It helps to keep the props and otherwise the whole thing collapses. So then a mind, even against their own resistance, are going to say, well, there are alternatives. Here's a historian I haven't heard, Arthur Bryant, or here's Antonio Ludovici, or here's, you know, another thinker, or I'm going to open my mind so I'm hearing the other side a bit more than I used to be before when my world was certain, right? So the uncertainty of modernity which created bizarre art as well, created bizarre music and all of that. You're sort of Stravinsky, you know, your deconstruction of a lot of norms. All of this is coming with the post-Nietzschean mode. And I'm for it. I am absolutely for it because we're here to talk about mentors. Man, how would we get an auto rank? How would we get uh, a Thomas Zaz? All of the people I would cite, including Ayn Rand, you know, as people who motivated me are people who answer that disenchantment, who are able to see the phoenix coming out of the fires. And that's why I go, you know, breathless trying to talk about those characters because uh, I know I know everyone needs it. I know that you know it'll restore your faith in a way, uh, faith in humanity, faith in that there is still a reality principle back of everything. Now I want to get into a number of your mentors that I found. If I'm wrong and these people haven't motivated you, just let me know and we'll skip them. Uh, what is the most important thing you learned from the work of Anthony Sutton? Oh yeah. Um, Mo, wow. 
a quick answer to that is one that his skull and bones group that he seems to have focused on because they tried to solicit him so he turned them down and he went to study who they were except he had access to the hoover institute and other institutes that only certain people can get access to so his study just looms then very large more than the average well-meaning catholic priest or like i said you know or somebody else uh, who's just a sort of a low-level journalist they've all done beautifully work they've done well but this is of another octave altogether because he was an insider he could get access he could get interviews with people of his own eminence that normally would go oh yeah close the door on, on a normal journalist and if there's anything second to that it's the scope it's the absolute we need people like that we need a john coleman we need an anthony sutton to say it's not just a little masonic thing happening you know down the street you know which a couple of investigative journalists can have as a headline you know in the washington post for all of a week you know and that's it all no this is bigger than watergate this is bigger than any gate this is the world conspiracy and that scope is very very vital otherwise people get lost uh, you know another false uh, shadow play mirror play is in it's just something we can tidy up it's just you know some liberal Demo democrat republican thing some left versus right thing that crops up and that has cropped up there a very great many of the conspiracies are of that level and can be knocked on the head with you know the right kind of policing and the right kind of exposure what anthony sutton brings up is this is huge you want to know why a communist russia got created you know a soviet bloc this uh, we're talking about that now so the grandiosity, you know, of, of what he talked about, I think, is vital there with Anthony. Yeah, definitely. So uh, books you would recommend, America's Secret Establishment, His Skull and Bones Research. And what are uh, the other books or papers of his that you'd recommend? Oh, there's many. Um, the Wall Street, right? He went into the Wall Street uh, uh, issue. Um, uh, he went into the, the whole anatomy of Bolshevism, how it's funded by the so-called capitalists. Yeah. So he has a key key piece there. They're not capitalists, of course, once you've digested, they're rich socialists. Big difference. Even that piece hasn't sunk in in the 21st century, that there's a monumental difference between a true capitalist in the Randian sense or, you know, that kind of sense, uh, and a rich, super rich socialist, you know, in the shape of a Bono or... Or Frederick or Engels, Soros. the guy funding Marx is, yeah, <laughs> is a rich socialist. Ba back to the very beginning. You don't even have to go to Jacob Schiff or any of uh, these other guys. So Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, America's Secret Establishment. Um, you said he did some work on the uh, Masons, did you say? Well, in or the sense that he, yeah, uh, derivatively, you know, as he was doing his skull and bones thing. But didn't he oh, do... Okay. Uh, didn't he do... Uh, Oh, what's the one? Trilaterals over America. Trilaterals yeah. over Washington. That's Washington, right. Washington, yeah. yeah, the trilateral yeah. society. Another important piece, because remember, like John Coleman, G. Edward Griffin, and Anthony Sutton, those three go together well. And there are other names like Dan Smoot and others, but those three stand encyclopedically because, oh, and let's add Eustace Mullins into that, so make it four great authors who show you the, royal, the connections to the Royal London Institutes and the american organizations that piece is so vital that if you if you miss it you won't have a vision so how london tavistock uh, royal institute of international affairs right your uh, chatham houses and basically the british round table groups and structures which is a huge huge network how they impact america's destiny that is why those four authors are absolutely essential now, I know you spoke about her earlier, but I love hearing you talk about Ayn Rand. What is uh, What are some of the most important things you learned from Ayn Rand? How to think. How to think. What is really of value? She gave me the psychopistemology I was speaking about earlier. Sort of going about in the dark with this placard and that placard and this opinion and that opinion. And you're not in contact at all, you know, with reality. Uh, her first, uh, at 14, I'd seen The Fountainhead, the film. And I copied out by hand, you know, wrote out uh, uh, the speech at the end, right? The famous hard rock speech in court. Kept that with me wherever I went. Didn't understand half of it, but it, it just sounded beautiful. And the, the power of, of, of the film, you know, really struck me. And then in 1991, um, when I was about maybe around 24, something like that, I uh, picked up one of her books, A Philosophy Who Needs It. And read that uh, oh uh, now right it was more clear something that it implicitly characterologically had aligned with and, and supported now it was more clear philosophically what you was it wasn't as it wasn't as daunting 
I can make, I just totally gelled with that book. And I recommend that book as a starting place for a lot of people who are new into her philosophy who needs it, you know, and then move from that point. So basically uh, she gave me the, to realize the value of having a mind, uh, which is a, which is an ontological starting point. You're free then to do what you want with it later, but at least discover that a mind is a valuable thing. It's a tool. Yes, yes, yes. But instead of just thinking and just emoting, right, and just talking about reason and, and all of that, celebrate it. Really, really, uh, really inhale the fact that this is a, a valuable thing that man thinks. You know, not just what he's thinking about, but that he can think. And that is, they call, Brandon and her call that a shift in your cognition. Your reason isn't the same as another person. You become superior to those other people. You know, uh, from a personality, behavioristic point of view, there is a, a difference. And those who think without valuing thought, they're of a different grade. And these are all uh, uh, unpalatable ideas right now. You know, they're all anti-PC. But so what? They turn out to be the things that make a man. You know, it's like what, what, when did Conan Doyle say that mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself, but talent can always recognize genius. So she is talking about the genius type and the talented type who go on to build a civilization, not the mediocrities. That's why her philosophy is very unpopular amongst people, especially socialists. What is the uh, some of the most important things you learned from Yuri Bezmanov? Yeah, again, his work is more supportive. Uh, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not original, because anybody who'd already been, you know, like growing up in Britain, the Cambridge spies. You know, we grew up with all. My dad was a Marxist, so he had a ma major meltdown uh, when when the Kim Philbys, you know, and Anthony Blunt's. So people have been following a little bit, you know, through the 70s, the 60s, the sort of John le Carre, you know, conspiracy world, which is brilliant. And, and he exposed or say Robert Ludlum and all. It wasn't such a great discovery that KGB defectors existed or that when they defected, they told the truth about, you know, what was going on behind the Soviet bloc. And uh, your Stanton Evans, who's a monumental character, uh, American writer. And even before him, you have your Senator Joe McCarthy, right? So it's not that Yuri's work is in any way sort of original to that degree, but it is highly supportive, you know, on a beta level, which is still vital, to support from inside because we get so much flack as being conspiracy theorists that you're empty, you've got nothing better to do, where's your National Enquirer, mate, where's your tinfoil hat, that when a senior KGB operative who's lived in very, very difficult, you know, has had assassination, you know, things out on his head and all of that, you know, speaks and speaks with such monumental authority. I think it's absolutely wonderful. So in a supportive way, I'd say that Yuri Bezmanov is a very important character. What are some of the most important things you learned from State Senator John DeCamp? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, wow, we're moved into the deep waters here. Again, uh, not that anyone didn't know, right, that uh, pedophilia, child abduction, child sex rings wasn't going on. There's been many who've, who've spoken of that from, from way back. But again, having a major senator, like you had Gary Allen, you know, in the politics and, 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 and major figures in the church and a major breakaway people like Father Roberto, you know, Al, Alberto Rivera and all of that. So and especially for me, because my work always focuses, not just a little bit like other people do, but it is majorly dependent upon a very sort of high, high brow type. Not that I've not added a lot of my own thought to that, as I've done with all the authors I, I study. But yeah, I, I, it is dependent on those. And, and so this, this, uh, so, so, so John DeCamp's exposures, although again, not original, right? Uh, are immensely important in the wider story of uh, very dark satanic organizations operative right today in a, in the American milieu, in behind entertainment, behind rock, behind country and western, behind that monstrosity you know of just Hollywood TV. S some stuff has leaked out. Yeah, great. That's tip of the iceberg, you know. And 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 if you put a, a book like that in front of people, more likely they're going to listen and go, "I'll take that up now." You convince me, mate. You know, Lieutenant Bo Greitz, uh, Ted Gunderson, chiefs in the FBI and people of that ilk. Yeah. Makes my job a lot easier, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, for people unfamiliar, he wrote a book called The Franklin Cover-Up, and it all came about after he said, 
it, people are saying that there's some, you know, ring, this is ridiculous, I'd need to see the facts, I'm waiting to hear the whistleblower. And then a guy named Paul Bonassi writes him a letter from jail saying, I'll tell you all about the ring that I'm a part of. So he called his bluff, and then this senator was kind and open-minded enough to keep his word and interview the guy, and he says all this stuff that the media was misreporting but was able to be verified – so we have an extremely reliable source that Noreen Gosh used to get information on her son. So we could get information about, you know, the uh, 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 I, I don't want to say who they thought it was. But um, yeah, and then Ted Gunderson, yeah, John DeCamp was just so, so good on, on all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the most important things you learned from the work of Thomas Sowell? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know that much about Thomas Sowell's work. Everything I've seen, I like. And I've always meant to get more into it. Um, and again, what I always hear is more supportive of what people say in the Mises Institute or others I've read say. And he's, come, come, you know, like a Charles Murray would, uh, you know, wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff supporting. See, there's a lot of support. There's there's core information and then those who come from eminent places to support it, you know. And I love that, actually. I love the fact that you get them in the highest areas of sport. Or journalism, or the Hoover Institute, right? And so this was a this dream come true to find that so many eminent people actually are corroborating, you know, like Pearl Harbor, or you know, the, the World War Wars, or you know, uh, uh, Pat Buchanan would be another name, right? And so it's not that there's absolutely tons of original work in there. For a conspiracy theorist, that's often not the case. I mean, there are exceptions, right? But generally speaking, a conspiracy theorist recognizes the content of these people's work. But is glad to have a modern iteration of it because remember some of our fathers in this movement are all passed on already, you know, like like Eustace Mullins and others and Ezra Pound. So we need we don't want to then run threadbare. That would be awful, you know. So having some sort of Ann Coulter types and Thomas Sowell types, you know, Ron Pauls and all, it, it, it's all good. It's goose, you know. It's 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 perfectly fine. Sauce for the goose, you know. It, it, it's great. We need all the support we can get. We don't want people falling away and then their reputations and their their notoriety being completely forgotten. That can happen. And uh, what about Joseph McCarthy? Any original contributions or anything that just was brought to light as a cause or result of you looking into him? Yeah, many things there. Uh, I would certainly recommend Stanton Evans, M. Stanton Evans, uh, just to celebrate the man himself, let alone Joe McCarthy, a wonderful patriot. Uh, yeah, he is. He's original. Now, he moves up from the betas to the alphas because he and his group, obviously he had other people around him, they went up against the establishment first. An establishment that wasn't as pleasant as we, you know, this is the 50s, right? You know, oh my goodness, uh, one must only look at the you know, fate of somebody like Wilhelm Reich and a lot of others. So, yeah, I mean, come on, you know, this is a guy who really took him on, called him out, named the names. And so for an American person who's interested in the secret history of America, this is almost the starting place. And then the diatribes that were fired at him, all of which were completely preposterous, is another good place to start. That will show you what you're up against. It's the same thing, say, if you were into slightly in a different gear, the work of Emmanuel Velikovsky. What a place to start. And the attacks that were levied on him, you see. So in the political sphere, Joe McCarthy would be one of those people. You not only find out what he had to say, which is extremely accurate, but then the welter of the blowback also puts you aware of what will happen to you if you deep throat the whole thing, right? So wonderful, wonderful patriot, yeah. Yeah, uh, the uh, Venona papers, I think they're called, were like the actual documents uh, c confirming everything he said so many mm. years later. I think it was 349 yeah. communists in the State Department, Harry Dexter White, Laughlin Curry, Alger Hiss, uh, the Rosenbergs. Um, but but he's still seen as this villain. Meanwhile, uh, uh, well, uh, I, we'll, we'll get into those people later. Uh, uh, Alan Dulles, <laughs> bro the Dulles brothers. yeah. Certainly. Uh, what are some of the most important uh, contributions or things you learned from Robert Welsh from the John Burke Society? Yeah, uh, uh, all, uh, you know, superb patriot again. Uh, and I was introduced to that through the work of G. Edward Griffin. Uh, and uh, I had heard of the, vaguely of the John Burke Society, but uh, um, didn't join myself because, unfortunately, after coming out of Ireland, Northern Ireland, 
and this is just a foible, right? But I, I've always had a, a feeling, if you want to call it that, that all these right-wing groups, of which I completely support, are infiltrated by the enemy. And I'm an outsider in America, you know, have a green card, all the rest of it. The last thing I wanted to do is be deported when I've just got to the place, right? So the hard facts of that was as much as I would have loved to go and actually actively support, you know, yeah, but I'm not an American yet. I, I can't vote yet, right? All of these things. And I'm, why put a target on your back? So just out of self-preservation, ideologically, I was aligned with these groups and they've been around a lot longer than me. So, you know, my contribution isn't that crucial. So I just had to stay back a little bit partly from this rational fear of knowing that these organizations have been thoroughly, uh, what's the word, infiltrated by communists. So I just had nothing to, and then, you know, because of my status in the country, uh, being very patriotic at the same time, I just knew that, look, as much as I'd love to join some of these patriotic groups, you know, it's really not logical to do that coming out of Northern Ireland. If you came out of Southern Ireland, um, where the uh, person is much more favored, because they're Republican, they're socialistic, they're collectivistic, and uh, they may even be tied in with Jesuits and stuff like that. So they get more green cards handed to them. This is back in the 70s, you see. They get more favor. People in the north of Ireland don't. So to get into America, you know, to get a green card and all, was very, very, you know, lucky, you know. So I just didn't want to compromise. But yeah, Robert Welch and the whole group uh, support their work. Stuff I've listened to all the time. You know, I've got books of, of, of their memory. I'm reading one now, a, a masterpiece by the leader of the John Birch Society now. So it's just, uh, you know, and, and I'm plowing through that work. So I think they're an extremely brilliant resource. And I do, I do recommend that people support them. What's the, uh, some of the most important contributions from Pat Buchanan? Well, I like his writings. You know, he, he's not perfect, but I'll tell you one thing, his book, uh, I've always I've always been studying the Second World War, especially the duplicity of Winston Churchill. So his book, Churchill, uh, The Unnecessary War, it's called The Unnecessary War, Churchill, Hitler, blah, 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 right? Subtitle. What a book. That book is definitely contains original stuff. And if it if it if if even the uh, material there, if it isn't original, some of it, you won't find it elsewhere because I know I've read so much. So to find what he's put there and not just him, but he's got a team. You know, uh, the research that that team has done and he himself has done makes that book one of the most important books of the 20th and 21st century. So just that book alone, not even the rest of his work, you know, just that book alone contains extraordinary information that must be made part of the narrative. You know, I'm not a fan of Hitler. I don't I don't buy into anyone who tries to minimize the role right, of Adolf Hitler or make him into some kind of... Um, Paragon. There are people within the conspiracy movement who do that. I am certainly not one of them, right? But at the same time, what do we know about the equally aberrant characters in Romania, in Hungary, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, whose decisions changed the fate of Europe? We always just want to look at one guy, or Mussolini and Hitler, Hitler and Mussolini. Boy, that covers it. No, it doesn't. You had fiends, fiends, you know, like Franco and, and all of these people, right? I want to know about them. And believe me, that, that book goes, goes into it. So full marks. How about the work of Sigmund Freud? Yeah, I got a very high regard for Freud. Uh, I think he's one of the essential people that we spoke about earlier. You know that we're after the Nietzschean age. Um, there'll be different kinds of free thought. There'll be different openings and avenues, different zeitgeists. Freud is essential in so many regards. Now, this is said, even though I know all the imperfections and error, there are there is error in his work, right? Many of those were corrected later on, which will never be often told to you, you know, by his, his daughter, Anna Freud, or his secretary, Otto Rank, and others. So a lot of those errors are really even not, not a big as, they're not as big a concern as some people make them, right? So there's a lot of duplicity when you come to Freud. A lot of duplicity. Um, but that still doesn't mean that he, you know, he had imperfections in his insights. And I talk in my work about what they are. There's really two that are hugely great errors in his work. But in general, he's essential. And even in terms of his sort of bestial rendering, you know, he gets ha hammered by Christians and other people who don't know anything about him or his work. They'll hammer him because they'll say, well, that picture of man is a beast. 
We don't need to listen to anything else he says. Sure, that's not correct, right? And it actually isn't correct. They're right to that extent. But the thing that Freud was doing, if you'd read him more, is he wasn't actually really, con he wasn't convinced that man was a beast. What he was doing was, well, he was continuing what Nietzsche and Schopenhauer had done, which is pull out all the plugs and let's have a reset so that we understand man without all that supernatural, angely, fluffy stuff. I want to look at man, what would now would be called phenomenologically, right? It's just look at man as he is of a day in his dark dreams, his, his hatreds, his uh, insecurities, right? His uh, hang-ups, right? And I love that. I know, and I know why the others don't, because they still want that supernaturalism. They still want all that airy-fairy stuff. Like Nietzsche, he swept that away, and he wanted to see man as an existential being, part animal, after you know being at the head apex of the, what do they call it, the food chain and all. Yes, he did look at that. But that's not just because he had some rude understanding that man is a primitive beast that came out of a cave. That's a totally misunderstanding of that. What he was doing was an exercise in materialism, an exercise to materialize, to reduce, reductionism would be the better word. And as horrible as that sounds to people often, and in many ways is, the Freudian version of it has a lot of credibility and was thought out much more than just, I'm a raw materialist, don't tell me anything about. This is a man who meticulously studied religion. His father begged him for years to return to Judaism and he wouldn't do it, right? A man who had thoroughly studied inside out Greek culture, Egyptian culture, right? His first awards were given in, in the subject of history and anthropology, not psychology, right? So the man was a, a really, a, what do you call it, a, a, a polymath. You know, and then he's one He's one like Hegel who you cannot take down. He wins no matter what because every time somebody tries to scream in Freud's face, Freud wins because it's a, you'll see the Freudian slips and you'll see the Freudianism of why they're against Freud. Don't try to take on Freud because the very things you're going to say will, will cycle back. And he goes, yeah, I told you so. You got those hang-ups, right? It's a mother thing. It's a father thing. Watch out when you start throwing darts at Freud because, you know, they'll be, you know, pointing one finger and three pointing back. The man has understood your 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 sublimations, your compensations, right? Your veiled compensations, you know, uh, uh, the stuff that lies underneath. So, you know, I love that. I think that's absolutely marvelous. And the main reason to answer your question is he brought introspection back, which the positives, positivists and many other of the Cartesian world uh, either erased or were putting on a merely superficial level, right? Uh, he was, well, the two things. One, he brought in, introversion back as a necessary component of human dignity and, and existence and identity. And he showed against Descartes and the whole rationalist school, you're not, as you think you are, in control of any of your behavior or your thinking or your awareness. That is massive. How can you then fiddle about with some smaller errors that the man made when he's handed you something so magnificent? How about his... Uh, excuse me. How about his nephew, Edward Bernays, who wrote a book? One is called Crystallizing Public Opinion. The other is just called Propaganda. The New York Times, when he died at 103, I think, called him the father of public relations. Have you read any of his work? Oh, yeah, many times. And he is the father of public relations. Yeah. He's along with some other pretty awful characters. You know, this was a, a very awful person who himself was a public relations officer for himself, his own image. And one of those things that he did uh, to, you know, enlarge his own uh, persona was to keep citing that he was the nephew of Freud. So Freud had married a lady who was called Bernays. Her family name was Bernays, right? And so uh, her brother or something, you know, uh, 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 was the uh, father of Edward Bernays. So the connections are fairly tenuous, and they're even more tenuous because Freud, as an ultra-conservative, would never for multiple reasons, I've endorsed anything that, in fact, it would have been so scurrilous, it, he would have recoiled utterly from any commentary about the mass mind or how to manipulate it. Oh, he wanted to liberate it, right? Not, not oppress it through subliminal techniques or persuasion or anything like this. If the man had still lived, I'm sure he would have taken a very big cane to his backside uh, after Edward Bernays tried to, you know, popularize, if that's even the pathetic... You know, uh, and especially in America, because Freud had written off America in no uncertain terms, 
in the most vitriolic way. Didn't want to, didn't care to follow the translations of the titles of his books. Didn't care if any book of his was published in America. Had made resounding no nos about it. Didn't help the APA. Didn't help the Freudian Society. So Jung turned out to be the golden boy. You know the the wonderful uh, golden boy of America, with institutes springing up all over the place. Freud, what, as far as he was concerned, the place didn't even exist. His final statements were something like, "They'll never get what I'm talking about anyway. So why are you all bothering?" How about I mean, the he was work... serious. He was totally mm-hmm. serious about that. Yeah. How about the works of Carl Jung? Yeah, well, they're essential. And I've had a, li- a long, 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 very long love-hate relationship with the man as I pick through his work to see if there's any weaknesses and all the rest of it, right? And went on a journey of colossal proportions, labyrinthine journey to do that exact thing. So Jung plays a very big role in my life. Mostly a lot of hate in the in 90s and say, oh, no, 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 no. But yeah, 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 yeah. Glorious, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, incredible story there. Probably the only greater journey was studying Heidegger. It took me on a much more labyrinthine job. But taking out Heidegger, then the next, you know, the next uh, Admundsen goes to the South Pole journey, you know, was uh, was with Carl Jung to try and sort of play devil's advocate and disprove him. And I have a large dossier on that that's going to be into several, you know, premium programs I'm doing on on Slave down the line, where we go into all these fascinating details. However, at the end of that journey, I've come out supporting his work, not not casting him aside or any of that. I actually think he was one of the greatest teachers and philosophers. But by God, have I gone through a full, you know, dirty laundry investigation of the man to make that to myself. To verify, because remember, although great he is, if you're a skeptic, well, he sits alongside a lot of very great people too, and he plagiarized a lot of them. There's huge chunks of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche uncredited in Jung's work. You know, so it was thought like that, and he, they're not the only two I could cite. There's many others: Tillyard de Chardin. You know, you have Gabriel Marcel. You've got so many thinkers around the man. You've got Kierkegaard, right? So I'm thinking originally, yeah, what's so big about Carl Jung? He just nicked a quarter of it from Freud. A little bit from Adler, a little bit from Rank. What's left? And all that archetype stuff, he got that from alchemy. He got that from Nick, uh, Nicholas Cusa. He got that from Jakob Bohm, right? And all of that. And that's all true. So as you peel the man down to see if there's anything left, I was, I was ambivalent. I thought, well, maybe there'll be nothing left except, you know, a stick insect, or maybe there'll be something substantial. Well, after the whole journey, as I repeat again, oh, you know, I come out full marks for Carl Jung all the way from the beginning to the end. Love his work. And how about final philosopher uh, Friedrich Nietzsche? I'm uh, I, the only time I had heard of him is when he was associated with National Socialism, and I had never heard like extensive arguments. So I'm curious what the most important uh, things you learned from the uh, his work is. Many things, uh, many things. Not as great a teacher as Heidegger for me, but certainly you know, or Marcel, but certainly vital. Um, without him. You see, I always think of him in, in, in uh, along with. Well, you have to you have to think along with Schopenhauer, but a little less known person, Karl, Karl Kraus. Right, the modern version of that would be Thomas Zaz. So I don't just think of Nietzsche. I think that what he did impacted what we know as psychiatry, uh, sociology. So I don't think of him as a great philosopher, as a philosopher, but as a cultural critic in the same way that Zaz, Krauss is, and a really a large part of Schopenhauer too. Schopenhauer's philosophy is so utterly bankrupt that maybe in time to come, it won't also be called a philosophy. And Nietzsche's, although not being bankrupt, isn't really also a psychology, uh, it's not a philosophy, it's more psychology. You know, and it's more sociology, a critique of people, a, cri- a critique of consciousness, a critique of religion and all of this. So very, very vital there. As to the Nazi thing, that had nothing to do with Friedrich Nietzsche himself. This was due with his sister Elizabeth, who when Nietzsche had gone mad, uh, you know, because he, he had gone and tried to save a horse from being beaten wild, wildly and uh, it fell down into a, a stupor from which he never recovered. And there's been a lot of, uh, you know, thoughts about why that happened and how it happened. My theory is that the horse jerked and physically hit his brain. It had nothing to do with syphilis or anything like that. Um, anyone who knows about horses know that they twitch. And if you come running over to one and grab it by the snout, the very first thing that the horse will do will jerk. And have you ever seen the size of a horse's head and think of the bone in there? Mm. That's like being hit 
by, you know, RSJ. So the poor man probably had, uh, you know, uh, uh, was sit, you know, and at the time in the furore, he doesn't think, it's like when, you, you know, you could be really badly hurt and you're not aware of it till later. I think he had something that um, damaged his brain at that point. But getting back to the point, it's his duplicitous sister who used to sit him up like a whore in a window and sell him to the public at that time when he was deranged. And she is the one who uh, first uh, wrote works, her and her husband, they were such foul characters, you know, they tried to set up a proto-fascist organization in South America. And when that didn't work, the two of them came back to Germany, right? And then start uh, producing literature of a sort of a Nazi, proto-Nazi complexion. And with Frederick Nietzsche's name nicely, you know, involved in that whole game. So this is the origin of it. Friedrich Nietzsche was already out of his mind. And, and, uh, and if you go back to his work and actually read some of his thoughts on Germany, you'll see that immediately how preposterous the whole thing is. Have you uh, read the works of Carol Quigley, the author of Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American Establishment? Yeah, I've read uh, both of those and, and then a third book that sort of condenses it by an author I can't remember the name of. Um, that's a good book because it condenses, you know, the main parts. And it's, Tragedy it, and Hope 101 by Joe Plummer. Yeah, that's the one. That's yeah, the one. that's Reckon, really good. Yeah. It yeah. is good. Yeah, there's a, again, he is another one we should include, Carl Quigley, because it, it, that would be number five. He is the one who originally opened the door and look at the eminence of this guy, right? I mean, you can't get any more eminent who first started to speak about round table groups in the verbatim. I'd say probably John Coleman is next in, in eminence because he was a member of MI6. But Carol Quigley is mentioning the British establishment, the Anglo-American establishment. And I'm, I'm still to do reams of work on this because I'm trying to synthesize all of the people we've been talking about, right, with that mixture of my own thought on it. Because remember, every single teacher we're talking about, um, I don't, I don't um, commit to 100%. It would be too lengthy to go into why. I mean, it's obvious. Any, any scholar is not going to buy, you know, I'm not the first to be like that. You can really identify, even with Ayn Rand, I've got, you know, problems with a lot of her philosophy. You know, how she didn't really do so much as she should have on psychology or a little bit uh, dismissive of Immanuel Kant, for instance. There'll always be things, right? And just because I haven't ever iterated these things in my career, you know, people think, well, you just cut and pasted then from that person. Well, I could do, I'll just pick up that book then and it'll all be in there. Well, be my guest, go and find that out. And people, to their shock, find out that there's, uh, you know, it's not, not as simple as that, right? But for certain, these are important figures because it's all important to understand the roots of America that although a war of independence was fought, independence was not actually won. I don't know who, who has said that, say, uh, say, Americans said, we're always famous for the wars we, we're always, fa we're really famous, us Americans, for losing the wars we win. Yeah. A lot of wisdom in that. I don't know if it was Chuck Norris who said it or whoever, but it's it's absolutely true, or it was Bo Greitz. But the thing is that it's the same thing in terms of uh, the War of Independence. It's the same thing as with a wall falling down in 89, 90, whatever. The wall may have fallen down, mate, but communism didn't fall down. So, you know, double take there, right? Well, same in America. A, a War of Independence was fought, but a War of Independence was not won. And the war still goes on, and lucky were those Eustace Mullinses, you know, who were instructed by an Ezra Pound. Lucky were those Deidre Griffins who stumbled upon it in whatever way. And what, that's still going on. There's nothing changed. Modern conspiracy theorists of the American side who read these Stanton Evans, who read these wonderful people, and even your Pat Buchanan's are in there, you know, uh, but there's so many other authors we could mention, Dan Smoot, uh, Senator Gary Allen, right? You will discuss that fact for yourself, that it was not one. And that the war of real independence, you know, has been carrying on, but that the British systems, and they're not just British either. I'm not, in, you know, not, in, not indicting the average British person. That's a, that's a, you know, this is a global black nobility, what I call the Black Lodge. Their center is in London, but that doesn't stop them having epicenters everywhere else. And one of them is right there in New York with your CFR headquarters, right? So that's the instruction. So Yuri Bezmenov, absolutely. A Geodre Griffin, absolutely. We need instruction, right? from the people who are going to give you that um, tutorial on who is the enemy, where's their names and addresses, what historical filth have they done you, like you say, with the Dulles brothers, the assassination of, of you know, uh, Joe McCarthy and many, many other great people who tried to stand up. And they're still professionally assassinating us now. 
you know, through social media, uh, shadow banning, by messing with your numbers and hits and, and, ev and everything else. And if these people actually are dumb enough to think that they can stop a guy from Northern Ireland from doing anything just because he's banned on social media, I know they're deranged. I'm on the right side. You must be stupid. I, oh, I must know more about human psychology than you do. Whoever told you you could ever stop a guy from Belfast because you're going to ban him on social media? He's going to skip up and run away and hide. Is that your estimation of a man like myself? I know I'm on the right side. You're going to stop at Joe McCarthy and Ezra Pound? The man went through 11 years in Bellevue Mental Asylum. Didn't slow him down. We're bulletproof, mate. Face it. Now, do you think there were important intellectual contributions made by George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, the who are referred to as the American founders? Or do you think that that was more of just a bait and switch sort of a, you know how we could really trick them, give them a vote between two of us once every four years, then they'll really buy into this. Well, what are your thoughts on the uh, philosophy of the American founders? All men are created equal, right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, those, those sorts of things. Yeah, what a question. Brilliant, brilliant, Keith. Uh, my, my real instinct after years of studying it is the latter, that it's mostly a bait and switch and a bunch of duplicity. How on earth would you back that up to a patriotic American and then say that, you know, well, you're calling yourself a patriotic, patriotic American, now you're not going to hold the Constitution? Yeah, but and I didn't. I went on a labyrinthine study before I did it. And along the way, I met, guess what? Nicholas Hagar. There's one of an eminent name for you. Right. And Nicholas Hagar, probably without going as far as I've gone, goes pretty much, you know, I use him as my main, you know, uh, source there. And then adding to what he doesn't say is this, because you can find a Nicholas Hagar page on my Irish origin site, I think, and that'll help people. I add to it this, and that is the world is run, not just by the right brain, but by the left brain, not just run by reality, but, but the word of the reality, right? In fact, even did a recent article called In Words We Trust, which also goes into this concept. And that is that you can have all the highfalutin words about a thing, but unfortunately the word is not the thing. And so you're quite right when a sort of a bait and switch, an idea came to the heads of people who really worked for these British structures that we're talking about. Some of those people had an ambivalent relationship with their masters, there's no doubt about that, but they're still criminals in my eyes, although they may have had fallings out and pillow fights. You're still under, you're not, you're not really for freedom as you appear to be. What you are is for the word freedom and the impact that that word would get. Or, you know, there's a thing I did called the Declaration Deception, in which it was discovered through this wonderful photography that they have now, that underneath the very word citizen, right, on the Declaration of Independence, actually still there, visible to not the naked eye, but to this instrumentation, is the word subject which was crossed out, as it were, and the word citizen, a more pleasant word. Yeah, and as I said earlier about some people, go, oh, that's fine, then. Uh, they just made a correction and they rubbed it out. We do that every day. But I've got a brain that actually sort of in the Sherlock Holmes mode goes, could we rewind and tell me, what? Would men who really had worked for 40, how many years did they work to write that document? And then right at the very last draft, right in the word subject, which is, you know, used by the queen and, and all the royals. That's how they're still thinking up until the moment of the writing of the Declaration of Independence. I'm worried about that. That does keep me awake. It might be an accident, just like, you know, the detractor will say, but it may not be. And, it, and then if it is not, then look what we've got phenomenologically. We've got evidence of deception right in front of us, which is why I call that little program you know, the declaration depend, uh, uh, the declaration deception. You know, it's been shadow banned. It's still on YouTube, but you have to put my name in and search for it. So, so that and many other things, you know, and then, and then a much more robust study showed me that it's mostly a sham. And that's why, do you see that in the movement of America, it's always been going in the wrong direction? You know, forgive me if I'm wrong, but when your, foot's, when your first step is pointing in the wrong direction, probably you're not going to get to the goal that you thought of. So the deception is often in its induction. Where it led is almost the proof of the original, you know, precept. So, yeah, and I've written on that. You can see my article called Constitution Con that's on the Michael Tassarin website. And I'm not, I'm not saying that everyone needs to believe it. I'm just laying out what evidence I can find. And it still doesn't mean that the Constitution isn't a working document. 
right? And if it was blended with the Articles of Confederation, you know, or some sort of, you know, update of the Confederation, and then with the Bill of Rights, look, I'm still for it, you know, I'm still okay. But at the same time, as I say, digging down deep into its, you know, the real complexion of it, look, it is parchment idolatry. It is the love of words, which words is not the thing. And that has to be understood. You cannot tell me that, you know, if I say carrot, that the word is the same thing as the, as, as the carrot, right? A donkey ain't going to believe you anyway. I can bet you on that. <laughs> Donkey knows the difference. Why don't how, we? Now, how about the uh, work of G. Edward Griffin? What'd you learn from him? Yeah, uh, you can't even imagine. He was, uh, when I got to America for my longest stay, I had several shorter stays in the 80s. When I got there in the in 91, it was about Desert Storm. So I start getting into, you know, Reverend Jack Moore, into uh, Father Chick, and, and um, not Father Chick, but the Reverend Chick. And I got into... Lord Davis, right? And uh, some of these Christian thinkers, Eustace Mullins and so on, right? And as I was studying, then one of the big names in the movement, as you're trying to find books and you're trying to find tapes, was Ed Griffin's work, right? And uh, his stuff on the Federal Reserve, con I mean, this was one of the big detergents for doubt, you know, because even in the early stages, I still had doubt, right? Even though I was fairly committed to the study, and after coming out of Ireland, it wasn't, I was I didn't need any kind of, you know, acculturation moment to study conspiracy. It was what I saw with my Marxist father and, you know, just stuff in the streets of Belfast, newspaper propaganda, you know, whatever, right? I was already sort of inured to it. But still, whatever sort of little bit lingering doubt is there, mostly from the voices of other people. By the time you've read Ed Griffin and men of that caliber, that's, it's all over me, right? If you read Stanton Evans and these people, right, it's all over. You are a, a different category now. There's no doubt about it. Because they have the citations, you know, from the son of FDR, from the daughter of this and the cousin of that and the uncle of that, confirming it. Because they've done their homework. They've been to the Library of Congress, you know, and they've done their work. And so he is one of the most thorough writers. He's also a filmmaker who made many, 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 many videos. And the videos are such con you know, so controversial uh, that everyone else in America is dropping it, not talking about it, what he did. And so those, like the capitalist conspiracy, but he made six, seven, eight, nine others. Yeah, second to none, really. You know, very, very high on the list. Yeah, he was great. I love when he uh, was, it's so funny seeing him as like this young guy in a suit and tie talking about how uh, communists will infiltrate America using, you know, riots on the streets where people would then justify the police state they otherwise would not have, which is going to be run by the same communists that are supporting the rioting and the looting and the oh. terrible chaos. Um, and he's like, he's like reading the own words of like the strawberry incident, I think is the name of one or i mean just think of the uh primary documents he cites frank vanderlip one of the guys in the meeting at the federal uh or at uh, jp morgan's house on jekyll island um it's like i i never even thought to let's look for the primary sources i just thought all right the teacher tells a story i parrot the story that's history it was never even introduced until i came across his work and do you know that he did a he did a video on the black movement and how we think BLM is new, right? Now go to Ed Griffin's you know socialism uh, videos and you'll see one that tears meticulously into how uh, uh, disenfranchised black people were used by the Communist International to undermine you know the sovereignty of America. See, I'm not I'm not against a lot of the ideologies of oppressed peoples or even women or whatever it might be, but I am against the lengths which these subgroups went to in order to, you know, make their point or, you know, get equality, actually de-equalized the whole of America. So, hey, if you got, you know, I love Mary, Mary, uh, you know, Godwin, or uh, she's more well-known, you know, uh, Mary Shelley. And, uh, and I can read liberals. Some of my greatest mentors in their early lives were very, you know, liberal in that sense. So it's not something that I have a, a you know, a case against. It's just that I do have it that when you form an inst institution to help you, you form an order that then has so much of a destructive effect on the body politic, on mainstream, that you're no longer assisting. You're actually now undermining. And it's so strange that in the 21st century that has to actually be iterated. You know, in fact, half this that we've seen since Trump got an election, I'm, a, I'm still working out why do we have to explain any of this to anyone in the whole wide world? They're so basic. And yet the, the reset is reset back to zero. 
resect back to imbecility. And uh, very similar, uh, Eustace Mullins. What, uh, what are some contributions of his? The main one was that uh, through him you find out about Ezra Pound. He actually did write a whole biography on Ezra Pound. It's a really good book called A Difficult Individual. Now, I had heard about Ezra Pound uh, from his influence on dozens of the most fa more famous uh, people like, uh, you know, T.S. Eliot, Ernest Hemingway, um, and, and dozens of others of the world's greatest poets. He is actually behind it. He was actually um, the full, oh, uh, James Joyce, can you believe it? And many others of that ilk wouldn't have been who they were. I mean, this is absolutely definitive. Would not have been who they were to change world history without Ezra Pound, who himself was anyway a far greater literary genius than they were. But, uh, you know, one of his jobs was to help these younger men get published and so on. So I don't know when I first got into Ezra Pound, but the fact that, uh, yeah, I can't remember the exact details, but when, when I got to America after the 90s, start reading this man. See, remember the skeptical side of me is looking for proofs as I'm going through this work. I'm not completely dead and believing. So that little, little, little level uh, of, of observation is still operating to see, you know, can I believe this? Or, you know, where's this corroborated? And when I found out that Eustace Mullins was the disciple and prodigy of Ezra Pound, uh, we're on a good track here of, of confirmation. America's greatest poet, look it up, that's what it says. And then same thing I would do when I was looking at the Lyndon LaRouche material. Here's a bunch of Marxists. Originally, they've sort of gone through a chameleon change. And I like a lot of their work. Here's Webster, Tarpley's, his Jeffrey Steinberg's. I like a lot of their work, but I'm looking for corroboration. I'm not just buying it wholesale like a lot of their audience did. The corroboration was in their details about the British royal family that most Americans don't know anything about, or the House of Hanover, or the houses of the Black Venetians in Italy. I know all of this stuff because I've been learning it, you know, growing up in Britain. So when the Lyndon LaRouche crowd, for all their faults, are still being very accurate about these royals, that's a very strong sense of corroboration that would be wasted on an American, but it's very attractive to a man like me going, you know, he's right there. All these alpha lodges of Freemasonry, absolutely, they're telling the truth. So, you know, so that gives you, it endears you to that group. Not wholly, I never commit wholly, but it's very, very good research-wise to say, oh, look at these guys, this is, you know, Dope Incorporated. Just read that book and tell me if there's one false line in it. You know, there probably is, but as I'm saying, and then generally, uh, the preponderance of the information is marvelous, despite other, you know, worries about their origin being highly Marxist and whatever. Yes, but see, I'm a very open-minded person. It doesn't matter to me that the guy is a Christian or the guy is, you know, an ex-Marxist or whatever. I'm looking at the material and I'll make up my mind. That's what I've done even with normal, you know, liter literati, let alone the, the, the things that you come across in the more alternative movements. You said you came to America uh, during the first Gulf War. Are you familiar with the babies and incubators lie that Hill and Knowlton gave to this girl? who was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador at yeah. the time. Do you remember th seeing that and thinking, um, I'm going to have to look at that. <laughs> Sounds like a t fantastic story. Or at the time where you're just like, oh, that's horrible. We should go in there. No, no. I knew the whole story that Kuwait is a absolutely ridiculous. It shouldn't have even existed. It's a uh, stitch up job from the British royal family who own Dutch Royal Shell. What we know as Shell gas stations is run, run from Dutch Royal Shell. And they're a conglomerate. There's other very powerful groups involved in Dutch Royal Shell, but the supreme head of it is the Queen of England. So uh, wherever the Queen, wherever that family has placed its, they're not British, right? They're, you can trace them back a long way, but the, the, I would prefer to think of them as the House of Hanover, like average Scottish people do, right? They're the House of Hanover, the Orange, House of Orange. What a gang. What a gang of mass murdering psychopaths, right? So wherever that gang puts its foot in the territories that they own, there's going to be trouble. So the pillow fights that they have are legendary. My work was, it does focus on that and will continue to do so. So no love of Saddam Hussein or any of those fanatics. But at the same time, you know, Kuwait was part of Iraq. It was part of the greater you know, Persian Empire and all of that. So as, as was, you know, uh, Palestine, Israel, all of that, all of these, all of these things are artificial. OK, so Kuwait was artificial. And then these the, the lady you just spoke about retired to a million, you know, for, you know, 140 acres of, you know, just along with uh, what's his name? Uh, the uh, secretary of state at that time. 
why does his name escape me? James Baker. Baker. She worked for him. Others did. They all retired to sumptuous, you know, positions, monies for 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 leading this. The, the, you know, not that the press is independent anyway, but that thing was made for TV, and it was one of the first simulacrums. You know, taking it from Baudrillard's side, you know, where you're, it's like a it's smart weapons and all of that. That was the first iteration of what Baudrillard had predicted would be coming. I think not predicted he, he had predicted it and Baudrillard actually commented on desert storm as being a virtual war mm. you know it wasn't boots on the ground as people thought it was one of these peculiar simulacrums which he predicted would be you know he, he said that the civilization was going in that direction and boy was he right yeah and i remember hearing i think there was something like the patriot bomb where like you know people were bragging about how many iraqi soldiers and as much as, you know, I'm against soldiers aggressing against, you know, innocent civilians, I looked into it and Greg Hartley, who would interrogate Iraqi soldiers, they were virtually all conscripts, which is code for uh, slave, basically forced labor. So, I mean, that's so sad. Do you see that there is a conscious effort to get people desensitized and to strip them of general empathy they otherwise would have if they weren't so busy justifying the crimes of the evil tyrants who like to rule us? That's been going on for a longer time. That's part of the bigger, broader conspiratorial movement right? and the, the, of the psychological talk into some of the higher groups. Because what most a lot of what we've been saying works on the political and quasi-political, your constitutions and all, of, and even even the division of these uh, countries that we just spoke of, that's geopolitics. What you've just addressed now is the little bit broader, you know, Fabian movement of the whole uh, gnawing away at Western civilization that we started with, you know. Uh, and by the way, just a point, when meet the press, uh, when both, uh, just one anecdote about that is that uh, when both Bush and Kerry were interviewed by Tim... Uh, his name, I can't remember, Tim Rifat, right? Russert. His name. Huh? Russert. Russert. Yeah. And he asked him about the skull and bones. They both sniggered. You know, you I see saw. The... Did you remember that? I, I saw that they were. <laughs> they were laughing and sniggering, yeah. In, in this foul, oh, satanic so laughter. <laughs> it looked oh, like and... Satan and his dog <laughs> were standing behind him when they did it to him. It was so hideous. And then Russell was like, three, two, two. What's that mean? <laughs> Not yeah, sure. Like they're, like they're the, going to tell him. Oh, yeah. And then he goes, the conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. It's like, you, we can't get a win with you guys ever. They're part no, of a secret can't. society where we have primary documents by uh, the Hoover Institute. <laughs> yeah, like Sir John DeCamp and Ted yeah. Gunderson said, you know, watch the butterfly. They're wearing the butterfly, the women are, you know, or they're wearing uh, symbols of satanic societies. And child abduction societies, you know, these Madeleine Albrights. And what does he have to do? Wear a big pyramid on the floor of his, front of his head? You know, yeah, the, the cognitive dissonance. But coming to your question about the overall Orwellian plan, Erich Fromm is probably the one who said it best. In the past, we were slaves. In the future, we'll be robots. And so w the idea is not to make a machine mm. that will rise up in some H.G. Wells vision where machines, right, will be running in the world for humans. That was thrown out in the 60s. You're, you're, you had the best minds on it. Who was the guy who was the head of cybernetics, who, these Ray Kurzweils and others, and all these cybernetics guys, they ran up against a wall, it wasn't going to happen. You know, Hubert Dreyfus and other people have exposed this. They found out by the, the beginning of the, by the end of the 60s, that's not the way to go. So they quietly flipped it and really bit down on the Orwellian idea, you got to reduce the man, the human being, to the robot. That's what our plan is. And, and then subsequently went into doing that. Billions and billions. And you can see subliminally, you know, if you look at your Star Wars type things, you know, this thing has been implanted in, 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 public, in popular culture in innumerable ways that you probably wouldn't first notice, like, you know, these movies of Back to the Future and all. We don't want to go there. But so the idea is that that has absolutely been happening. And I think that that's been more than successful. And since my focus is mostly on that, you know, that's why I, if I'm still an optimist, I have to check myself every morning on that one. You know, it's a bloody miracle. I think I still am, uh, you know, but it's it's it really pushes it to 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 be an optimist. You know, um, look at the addiction to the words that we mentioned earlier. We are addicted to the word. That's why you have your Anthony Robbins. That's why you've got your Obamas. That's why they can succeed, right? through the power of the word, not because of the power of the real thing. So there's an addiction going on that is already showing this regression into the swamp 
or into the semiotic. You know, and I've come at that from a different way through female psychology work, but you, you don't even have to have that as the header. This is a feminization on a mass scale. And that's not, not to indict any female, because the female is the victim of this as well. I mean feminization in, a in terms of typology. Right? And both males and females are in, you know, they're in uh, extreme danger, uh, DEFCON 1 danger because of this. Uh, and it can be reversed, but, uh, and also the way of America in its essence is to reverse it. But first we have to get off, you know, all of the different hands that are pushing the heads down into the swamp. How about the work of Neil Postman? Yeah, I've still got to do Postman's great work. Uh, I've got it on the shelf. Uh, so I can't say too much about that right now. But one of the biggest, again, a very eminent source. So just, you know, again, an eminent source whose, whose work is not original. All right. There's others who went into this before him. Uh, but the critique is essential. And the focus, the the forum is, a, is America specifically. So it's wonderful. And how about the work of John Coleman? Well, John, can, his work can never be, sorry, criticized because he was an ex-member of MI6 who left them, you know, out of a con sorry, conscientious objection to what they were doing in South Africa. So his books... Diplomacy by Deception and the Committee of 300, right, are crucial because they help bring a vast body of knowledge that you won't find in any other place. The closest probably would be Anthony Sutton, right? But I still think that John Coleman, you know, being from Britain and having the inside scoop on the British organizations that we mentioned is essential. He's a very good speaker as well. His lectures are excellent. And uh, yeah, I would say that his, he's addressing the black nobility. Mm -hmm. Um, my goodness, you know, there's so little on them. So in that regard, I'd have your Carol Quigley's, I'd have your John Coleman's, your Lyndon LaRouche group, you know, for the black nobility. My work is, I think, extended theirs, actually, you know. Um, so, yeah, people need to look into that. And, and, and also, to a degree, Eustace Mullins, who's written quite a few, his book, The World Order, right? The World Order, it's one of many of his books, but get that one if you're interested in the black nobility issue uh, and many others I could, I could name, you know. All right. Uh, anyone else? I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, who I've seen you cite in the past. Um, I, I'd like you to comment on either George Orwell or uh, Aldous Huxley. Um, have you, they're one of those that I see quotes of all the time, but I've never actually picked up their books and read. So uh, how about George Orwell and Aldous Huxley? Anything you learn from them? Yeah, well, see, George Orwell's books, 1984 and Animal Farm, are actually taught in school, or were, might be the operative word, in Britain. That was it. You know, there's all sorts of books that we were, I mean, these were compulsory. You're not going to get around it. If they didn't pick one book the one year, they'd pick it the next. And I think for a short time in American schools, they did too. But the thing is, that's probably all knocked on the head, right? So yeah, here's, here's those conspiracy nutters, right? Look, once upon a time, all kids in all schools in England were, you know, taught those books and HG Wells as well uh, and so on, right? So, so British sci-fi, is absolutely jam-packed with stories about, you know, future world, uh, global villages, you know, The Prisoner, Blake Seven, Doctor Who, I could go on. Even Space 1999 had, had issues, you know, had, had covered that. And it actually goes on, Equator Mass. I mean, the bulk of it is talking about this. And so they've left no stone unturned. In fact, some of those were so futuroid that they actually did talk about brain implants that would prevent you from rebelling against Big Brother. You know, that later on you're getting picked up by, you know, famous filmmakers in America with your equilibriums and, you know, and the, and, and the, your, your Stanley Kubricks or your uh, Francis Ford Coppola's, you know, with the THX and all of that. Look, it had all been done in British sci-fi, right? And in, and in literature like C.S. Lewis and George Orwell. So this was a group of uh, anti-socialists who because of their eminence, right? And because of their position, don't, don't forget, as young men, they were socialists. They were in at the ground floor of the origin of the Fabian society, um, which already puts them ahead of the general public. So while you're watching Coronation Street and uh, other shash, 
these guys were in there knowing, you know, what the agenda of the BBC was, what the agenda of, you know, the Observer magazine and all of it. They were following it and they were seeing these Fabians constantly being employed in, in the top positions, being seated all around. And so they are the ones that you go to to discover that if you're looking at little instances, right, of conspiracy, but you lose, you lose the overall picture. And if you go to the big picture, you won't remember the actual individual names or institutions or organizations involved. So these Orwells and all help you gain, you know, so you ask what I learned. It's like, I gained the right perspective at the, at the canvas, that it's, 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 it's completely fluid. And that all my friends and colleagues, all these co-students that I've run into in America, none of them were doing that. They were either right up against it, right? Or they were way too far back, right? But that didn't, and then they stuck there for the rest of their lives. You know, and I kept moving back and forth, and they thought I was incorrigibly ambivalent. But actually, what I was doing was thinking, right? And keeping, and I knew I hadn't read, you know, two books is not enough. So three books, four or five, 600, you know, 6,000, right? You go on to really get to where I am now. In other words, I went for the long haul, which is something almost nobody in society does today. I went for the long haul. I put my faith in the long haul, as opposed to these episodic, yes, eureka moments when I've got it, only to keep finding out, no, no, no. Here's somebody who contradicts that, you know. So it was a tremendous journey. That's why I call it labyrinthine, because in psychology, philosophy, and alternative subjects that we're talking about, I did that. I wouldn't settle. I kept looking at where's the opponent to this? What's the counter argument? You know. I uh, ran through a number of other articles on your site that I'd like to go through. Um, what was the forgotten slave trade? Oh, well, I mean, that's just, uh, there's many areas of that. You're either dealing with the Arabic one, because Arabs' uh, conquest was vast. You know, the wild nomads of the north. But, oh, don't ever forget that uh, you just need to look at a map of the Arabian conquest, you know, as it moved through the north of Africa and all over uh, areas. And so the habit there, and it wasn't just with them, the Vikings had it before them. Do you know that Dublin wasn't even a city? It was founded by the Vikings, and it was a slave city. There wasn't nothing there but one house standing there until the Vikings came in, right? And they, it was a slave port. It wasn't the only one that they had. So white slavery dates from the Vikings. The whole of Ireland has been abducted by... The young St. Patrick was abducted from Ireland, you know, all the rest of it, right? Came back later in his life and everything like that for the conversion. Well, the Arabs were into it, you know, uh, wherever, Mo and the Moors were into it, they're, uh, they're Islamic. But a small group of Jews who served the Moors, really had no choice ultimately, also worked in the slave trade. Now, anti-Semites just focus on that, and that's it. But it's much broader, right? Yes, uh, some Jews were involved, and, they, you know, they were dastardly to do that. But behind them was the whole Islamic movement. Glad that's over, right? Yeah, thing of history, right? Well, you know, know what you're dealing with because it's coming back. And uh, you mentioned a number of times on your site that Islam actually is a uh, threat that the West should be worried about. What evidence or reasoning do you have uh, to uh, justify the idea that we should generally look at Islam as threatening to uh, civilization, peace, harmony, property rights, and freedom? Well, that's just pure history. Now I don't have to add one you know, personal comment. You just go and study the history of Spain under the the Arabic, you know, as I said, uh, invasion of Europe, um, and so on and so on and so on. A, a, a good part of that would be the, even if you want to start la later days, then go and study the dynamic between Byzantine, you know, Byzantium, and the Mongol horde. It's called the Golden Horde. Look it up, just Golden Horde. This, of course, would be Genghis Khan, right? Uh, and the movement, this is 1300s, so it's around the time of the Black Death. So you can start at a reasonably late period in history, right? Uh, and then work your way back to the original Arabic invasions, which are much earlier. They're going back to the 6th and 7th century. So this is already, uh, Muhammad's just died around 5-something, and the guy isn't even cold, and before the, the, the Arabs are moving to conquer every single place. The butchery of women, children, and men, wholesale, right? 
you thought Attila the Han, Hun was bad, right? Uh, and, and the Huns later became Christians, but they were, you know, they were obviously pagans before that. Yeah, but look, 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 you know, Genghis Khan and his hordes, and then Suleiman the Great, and, and on and on it goes, right? Every one of these leaders just wanted to butcher and murder and did so. So, you know, the awful, and, and also they got to, yes, it was mainly f faux pas, and idiotic decisions within Christendom that allowed them to get this far. Kings hating other, king would not join in a, in a concerted effort to push back the horde. They left it all to Ivan the Terrible, who's already demonized in history, or they left it to Vlad the Impaler, who's been demonized in history. These were great heroes of the, of the period. But when they called out for other monarchs to join them, well, they got about 2.5. Yeah, two, two kings and a dog arrived, you know, to push back the hordes. This is actually a fact. Henry the Lion and one other guy. You know, but the great monarchs of Europe, like Charles the Fifth or whatever, you know, Charles the Second, whatever it was, can't really remember right now. They didn't join in the fight, and actually, in many ways, were you know sort of in collusion with the Islamic hordes. So you, you know, in order to win, win territories, and that that story will come out when you when you look into Orthodox Christianity, why the Russian Orthodoxies, you know, didn't they hated the papacy and the papacy hated them. In the dynamics in Italy between the houses of Venice and the houses of, say, Florence, why that you know conflict existed is all based in this. And when you look at then the larger movement, right, then it crops up again later in history, more moving up to the time of the First World War with the Ottoman Empire, which fell. Well, wait a minute, what's that? so? It's a, it's a reiteration of the same thing. Wherever these Turks are, the reason why the Ottoman Empire fell is because it was run by Islam, right? There, so no matter what conquest these Islamics made, whether it's into whatever country, right? They fail, except for one thing: they tax the Jews and they tax the Christians, and they use the artisanship of those two groups to keep their cultures alive. So what you know as Islam is the biggest farce of window dressing you've ever seen, and every presentment of culture that they have is largely bogus. With exceptions, right? The calligraphy, certain of the Sufi poets, which I know through and through. I've studied them all my life. Uh, and it has a big, one of the biggest impacts on my life are, are the great Sufi poets. But then there's, there's an ambivalence right there because some people say that the Sufi mystics were only, you know, keeping a facade of being into Islam. So, you know, they may not actually be representative of Islam. There's that whole story, right? But just back to the point. When you see that no Islamic country, I don't care who and what they are, could not in their inception exist without the taxation and the enslavement of Jews and Christians with their intellect and their progressiveness and their craft kept sustaining those groups. And the next part why they exist to this day is because they became westernized. So Asad Hussein, right, if you, if you go, if you look at all the potentates that came at the end of the uh, empire, these great Muslim empires, say in Iraq or Iran, it's only because now they've adopted a few Western traits that they then continue to survive in the appalling, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini, right? I mean, even then it's backward. Even then it's oppressive. Even then it's murderous. But they can just sustain themselves by Western uh, elements. And the Western man in his degeneracy has got the biggest cognitive dissonance over this. He refused, no matter how many people come on, online to talk about this, some of them extremely eminent, right? Like Robert Spencer and many others. Nobody is reading it. Nobody wants to know, you know, Philip Haney and God knows what. So many people I could mention, many of them from inside Islam itself, you know, who converted. So the journey goes on to expose this monster. And one last thing to say is for those who believe in a Jewish conspiracy dead at all, re always remember that the Ottoman Empire was top heavy with Jewish people. Right? They're called the Young Turks or, you know, there's other names. But some of the richest Jews that ever existed in the world, that even you'd think that even some of your Rothschilds and all, you know, look pale in comparison to, really, it's hard, funny to say that because people just don't believe it, lived in Salonika in, and other towns and cities within the Ottoman Empire, which fell. Anybody see a sort of a glaring contradiction here? Jews are responsible for the world conspiracy, right? But an empire in which they were almost the chosen few fell with all those billionaire Jews. Yeah, keep going, mate. Come on. And they wouldn't even have an answer for you. So, <laughs> you know, you have to, you know, just, it's ridiculous. Half the stuff written 
in the conspiracy world, you know, is is really appalling scholarship, actually. You know, uh, and uh, uh, you know, my part of my work is to go through it and show those errors. And it serves the skeptics so well because they could say conspiracies don't exist. L- let me show you about the Loch Ness monster. Oh my mm, God! First of all, that doesn't go. even meet the definition of a conspiracy. Uh, l- let me tell yeah. you about psychics and astrology and you know Hitler's brain flying in a UFO, that yep. sort of thing. So it just fits the narrative. Um, speaking of narratives, the uh, probably one of the most popular groups in America now is Black Lives Matter. The general narrative they have is not uh, from the start of America, 1619. Blacks were brought over here against their will. Enslaved have been severely mistreated. To this day, we see nonstop racism to the point of murdering them. This all stems from American racism. BLM is therefore a justified organization to intimidate us until the point where blacks are equal to whites. What are your thoughts on this narrative? Yeah, it's absolute nonsense. Um, Any injustices that were ever done against that group or any other group have long been made up for in the past, right? So that's my answer to that. Uh, they're an extremely privileged group. I don't I don't see any evidence of any systemic racism anywhere, but what I do see is that the BLM and their socialist supporters are the fascists, are the, are the uh, oppressors. Uh, everywhere they step in the name of equality, you know that word, they create inequality. So that thing has been exposed thoroughly by your Thomas Sowells and, and many other black writers who I love and I feature on my blog, right? And it doesn't carry one ounce of credibility, especially as we move up into modern times. It's the same bugbear that they try to use, you know, the IRA about, you know, nationalist groups in Ireland being the oppressed, uh, being the underdogs. And then uh, anyone who's lived amongst them knows that when they when they're when they were given beautiful flats and beautiful districts, they came out at night and smashed them up so that the cameras of the world would think of them as oppressed. Aye. Let's start with that. Right. Where no matter what you did for these people. They threw it back in your face. They damaged their own environments because they their whole premise is is the narrative is threadbare and only goes on by the window dressing of looking like you're oppressed, accusing everybody else, the white man and everyone else, and seeing how many people you can gather from some campuses, you know, to buy into that narrative. It's so utterly pathetically transparent that I'm amazed that Americans haven't seen through it. It just tells you that they've been watching too much I Love Lucy or Melrose Place or Baywatch or whatever it may, the modern versions of those may be. I'm talking about what I used to watch in the 90s, right, or not watch. So, you know, there's the modern versions of it. So it's awful, right? And none of that is educational. How rich TV could be, you know, uh, uh, to go the other way. But, of course, we know that that's a moot point. And then Americans don't read, all right, maybe a bit more now than, than before. So, of course, these lies are going to percolate. Because you, these groups are billionaires. They're controlled from KGB Central, which is, you know, very, very powerful. And you've got to realize that 90, you know, 80, 80, 80% of what you see on a Facebook or, or you know, is, is coming straight from KGB International. You've got to understand that. That'll make sense. So when you see some cops kicking the shit out of somebody, yeah, that was filmed in Moscow, mate. Do you know how easy it is to get a, a police uniform and put an American number plate on the car, which just happens to be inside of the camera? Shall I go on? Well, you do have to go on because the American too. Well, that really happened, right? I mean, you, you, that level of easy control without you knowing about how Soviet propaganda worked and still works because it says the, the wall may have come down, but no, the propaganda machinery continued. Even the Vatican get in on it. There's things that have happened, right, to form the socialist papacy. It's called a social socialistic Catholicism, right, or Christian socialism is what it's called. You've got Islamo communism. You've got things that have come up in the in in the nineties, after the so-called great events of liberty took place, that captured your attention on screen. David Hasselhoff singing on the Berlin Wall, half drunk, and the Scorpions, you know, we are love or whatever it was, you know, uh, and everyone went for that. that. That's the spectacular you're meant to look at. Communism is breathing easy. Now we can move into the cultural version of it. Yeah, how many people even know about that? How many people know that socialism is fascism? We're down to baby steps here, mate. Yeah, uh, you can certainly see the agenda of, you know, bourgeoisie versus proletariat, black versus white, man versus woman is the justification for, well, why should I give you guys, government, a ton of power and advocate you get more than $4 trillion a year? Well, there's this big evil problem that we have to solve. Oh, my God, it is. We have to start rioting. So um, I did a little research because, you know, that's just a theory I have. Um, about it. And it turns out 
that Roland Fryer, a, the uh, black professor at Harvard, says blacks are 23.5% less likely to be shot by the police relative to whites. There was a paper by Washington State University. Police are three times less likely to, to shoot unarmed black suspects than white suspects. You have uh, New York City University's John Jay College of Criminal Justice concluded that during the period ranging from May 2013 to April 2015, 49% of those killed by law enforcement officers were white, while only 30 were black, which is relatively in proportion to the amount of crime they commit. Examples like Duncan Lemp, Ryan Whitaker, Kelly Thomas, Daniel Schaefer. These are all on camera, by the way. So the idea, you know, that well, it would make the news, but it's not on camera. No, Tony Timpa is suffocated to death on camera like George Floyd was. 2019, police killed 41 unarmed people. Nine were black, 19 were white. So if you hear about a story, it's because they want you to hear about it, not because it's just in, you know, something that happens and the media is forced to report on it. And then finally, uh, as far as uh, blacks being oppressed, uh, black on white violent crime, 547,000 incidents uh, where the black is the aggressor and white on black crime is about 59, uh, 60,000 cases a year. So black on white crime is like 20 times higher than white on black, which by the way, I, I, that I care about the violence, not the demographic male. Female violence mm. is much higher than female on male. I, I'm not just playing to my group here. Yeah. I'm saying, I'm sorry. This is a con. Please step out of the BLM movement and uh, let's start cleaning up the cities here. Yeah. Uh, and, understand final that they've, yeah. and understand that they've had it before. The Black Panthers and the Weathermen and other groups related. 60, 60 bombs were set off in 1965 in California alone, exceeding what we are even seeing in the streets today. A few statues can be put back up and will be. But the, this incendiary action, action has happened, occurred in the streets of Paris, you know, all across the world. It's nothing new. And one has to then, you know, step aside, as you say, and then also start to look into their agenda. And there's wonderful people who are insiders, you know, Heather MacDonald and others who, who be, you should read. You know, people can read contemporary women and men who are inside these movements and who make the job easy. My blog on Unslaved, it's a little picture blog there, has... Book lists for three for the last three years, 20, 19, and 18, extensive. Pick two of each list and, you know, get into it there. And you'll find black authors, you'll find ex-feminists, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's not just all coming from one particular, you know, uh, limited biased perspective here. We're dealing with truth. And that's just, you know, no one needs to defend that. Exactly. And, you know, I, I hate to, you know, because people get very offended at that. And the reality is, if I had someone manipulating me or a spouse cheating on me, it, I would hate to hear it. But you got to know in the long run if you're getting played, because, you know, as bad as it is to get played for five years, five years and one day is worse and six years and seven years. Um, oh, okay. and one thing I must say, yeah. yeah, a great many of the books that you'll find on that list, not all, but a great majority of it, I'd say up to 80 percent are eminent. Like we've been alluding to earlier on, they're eminent people. They're they're very you know Hoover Institute, uh, you know Charles Murray, people like that. So again, it's not just your some junk I found in you know in the corner of some weird bookstore, you know uh, in the deep south or something like that. Far from it. Yeah, I forget where Thomas Sowell, what per, uh, university he worked at, but Glenn Lowry was the first uh, black man to get tenure at Harvard University in the economics department. This they CNN can't get their hands on this guy to clear this up so we can stop no. the rioting. Um, all right. Uh, how can you tell in a broad picture, how can you tell if someone is awake or asleep, psychologically speaking? Well, you go by the maximum of Mark Twain that everybody's insane and you try to look for the le the less insane person is, is one quick rule of thumb way to do it. Um, I gave up in the in, in, that time I told you about coming to America. It was about uh, 89, right? Late 89. I quickly uh, uh, in the years before that, and there wasn't many of those, but they were very impactive. Three years seemed like 300 of the experience of what you're saying. And so I got off that plane almost like had a didn't walk to a chamber you know in one of these chemicals it's a cold, you're, you're like there's a beam comes down and you're just sort of disinfected of, a, of any particular you know parasite you'd be carrying or whatever I went through a period just like that 
when it came to bothering about anybody else and their interests in this subject. And it was more like, you come to me, I don't go to you, you know. And it changed in form mm -hmm. because there were certain moments where I broke that rule. But it was very temperate. You're talking only maybe a few comments, maybe a day or two to a co-worker or whatever. And even then, even then, and, and there's other reasons as well. I was doing so much physical study that there just wasn't even the time. And I had to kind of not do it because I knew, oh, it's going to take away for another hour or two hours or even a day of reading Gerald Massey or reading Carl Jung. So I just wouldn't do it. But right even from the earlier stage, what we did do is this. Because as we said, we're always in participation. We're always part of a mitweld. My friend and I, what we did was we would copy, photocopy at our own expense, excellent sections from, say, Eustace Mullins. He was like one of our favorites, but there's many others as well. Uh, James Bo uh, you know, Nord Davis, as I say, the Reverend uh, Jack Moore. Oh, and so many other people, you know, uh, and we would go and leave those around or we'd pin them up, you know, at a particular bookstore or whatever. So it wasn't that we it were idiotically, you know, confined to Garrett's doing this research. We did. We, we really, we put out uh, all sorts of things, just if a single phrase, maybe, you know, catch an eye and we did thousands of those. And uh, we put around actually Spotlight Magazine, you know, which was a newspaper. We'd leave, we'd buy extra copies. Uh, if a book really hit us that was like absolutely phenomenal, like Pawns in the Game, you know, by Guy Carr, uh, he was a captain, we would then, you know, put those out, we'd buy six and seven and give them out to friends. And so we did this for many, many years. So although my general focus, you know, and, and personal decision had been no time for it, no interest in it, I believe that we still, I still met, you know, until that was knocked on the head, um, we did our best. To, to put literature around, you know, uh, and, and then also because then you're saying, OK, if this gets thrown in the trash, it gets thrown in the trash. So if somebody picks it up, we've got one convert, you know, so it was like that. And I think that was a lot healthier. I've never been I've never advertised. You know, never advertised. Uh, I advertised one time one for a thing that was, a you know. Which involved other people I was working with, you know. Whatever you call that it, it was a collaboration with other people, but for me and my own work. You know, uh, 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 you know, I asked for, you know, things like donations way at the end of my career. I'm like the last person to ever ask for it, you know, uh, and, and there's never been actually any advertising. Many, many people have always said me to do it. And I just won't because I know my work is not for everyone. And the, it'll be a situation of, you know, people will find me when the time is right. Uh, who are the Meads? M-E-D-E-S. Yeah, they were... Uh, Okay, to understand them, you have to understand the whole history of uh, the Persian Empire, right? Because they're really related. It's the same thing with the Parthian Empire, which is monumentally important. And the expert on that is Ralph Ellis. But the Medes come in there too because they're very ancient. When the Persian Empire was original, it, it worshipped uh, not... Uh, it didn't worship Ahura Mazda, you know, which all Persians know about later on being the great sun king and everything. Be like they're sort of Jesus Christ figure. They worship Mithra, mm. right, in the pagan days. And Mithra would, would be one of the oldest gods. The priests of Mithra would have been a solar cult. Uh, Jason Georgiani, who's an expert in all this, links them like I do to the Scythians. We totally agree on that point. And that's, to me, the most fascinating, because uh, the identity of the Scythians is also earth, earth shattering, and they changed the earth, they changed the world, they changed even British history, people wouldn't believe that. Now, the Medes grow up, they're sort of north of the Persian Empire, right, near Parthia, and they really, to me, right, are not a race. They're not even really a tribe, they're more like a priesthood. And only duplicitously do we get, they're the Magi, right? And the Magi are more a cult. So in Egypt, right, in Chaldea, in Persia, in Babylon, in Acadia, the, the high stratification, same in Ireland, right? The stratification is Druid at the top, all-knowing Magi, and everybody else underneath. But the thing is, what would happen if, because of the absolute chaos and ambivalence and changes geopolitically within the lower structures of these groups, these races, that the priesthood somehow come together and form their own sovereign state? So to my thinking, that's what the Medes were. They were the, con because so much change was taking place. 
in the Persian Empire, in terms of belief, excuse me, uh, you know, even the Mongols were having a say. You can't think of an empire that went through so much change, right? Before it got there, it ended up. So I really believe in short that the priestarchy, who are a cult, and they may not have even been a solar cult in the same way that, say, the Mithras guys were, and then the later Ahura Mazda, they may be in a stellar cult, my feeling. And they just happened, and this also buys into to geography because the the, the 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 latitude on which they're on, right, um, is also a key one for the stellar cult. You know, the Silk Road, you know, leading through. There's too much to go into now, but there's the very latitude on which Medea exists is indicative that this was a priesthood of an, of the stellar cult. So, uh, in other words, a very very ancient, you know, priesthood with connections to the Scythians who were Arya and to, you know, the Finnish groups and, and to even the Irish Scandinavian groups as well. So I think they were white. I think they were Caucasian and they were the high magicians, um, you know, who had been uh, descendants from Atlantis. Their bloodline wouldn't have gone back to a specific country per se. That That's the wrong way to read it, right? The Arya come from something past. And Tolkien knew about this, called it Numenor. Hyperborea, Ultima Tula, right? The extreme north. And, and that opens up the whole field then of the story of Atlantis, you see. And uh, you have done a lot of work on advertising. What are some ways uh, or some tips that you could give uh, the audience uh, so they could just keep it uh, in the back of their mind and make sure they're not being irrationally manipulated by advertisers when deciding what to spend their money on or spend their time doing. Yeah, that's a key question because one of the ultimate ways to get into the subjects we're talking about is through the store. Because it's so unpalatable, politically incorrect and controversial, I always suggest or did you know, in the past and still do in a way, uh, that this is one of the royal roads for just a young teenager or whatever to get. Don't be listening to us talking about Persian empires and occult histories of Ireland and all. Study your Mars bars. Study your Nestle. Study the advertisements on TV and the billboards. That's that's the level you need to be on. Why so many meditation poses? What's that got to do with a big, big gulp? Or Pepsi, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm losing it, right? Um, look at the uses of mirrors. You're talking about the subliminals and, and take it from there, right? Right, And then read Brian Wilson Keys and read Gene Kilborn and read, uh, what's his name, you know, uh, Media Virus, Douglas Rushkoff, you know, and then come to my work because go through the simple doors, easy doors first, and then come to the occult aspect of it, which they leave out, all those guys. But at least familiarize yourself with that, how words are used to entrain, how images definitely are, how light is used in advertising, and, and know the fact that you are indeed you know, watch the movie Agency with Robert Mitchum. And you will find out that you are indeed being manipulated in, in a very, very big way. And until that piece, you talked about Edward Bernays and people like that, until you are familiar with that aspect of the mind control, you know, you're still pretty jelly. I, even, as much as your intellect may know things, you really haven't got, you're still manipulatable. You become ironclad. You become highly immune, what I call psychic immunity, when this piece is plugged in, because then they can't mess with you, because they are messing with you, and they do it in a very sophisticated way. So yes, uh, I have uh, you know subversive symbolism podcast. I've got a couple of articles. You know, we have gone into that. An age of manipulation is like a mega work that I got the opportunity in Sweden to do it three months. This this thing would be over, you know, a, a lengthy period of time back in 2010, and I went into the creme de la creme that I have, because that, that, even that time was short, you know, so I packed, so people check out Age of Manipulation, it's on Unslaved, oh my goodness, and there's there's other programs as well, but that one is really, really condensed, uh, and talks about all the different satanic, you know, symbolism and all of that. Well, just, I, I forget how young I was, but I remember... Uh, having a conversation where I was talking to someone who's very into, you know, freedom, libertarianism, conspiracies, and he goes, don't you love how they have the good-looking people smiling, drinking the beer, as if, 
you want that, and they associate what you want with their beverage, so it just rents space in your mind. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go out and buy it, and now they see how much money they made off the ad. They're just letting you know that they're there and getting you to associate happiness, being in good shape, smiling, uh, laughing with their product. And now, I got to say, I, I think it's fine that they do that in the same way when you're on a first date, you sort of make yourself appear to be better than you really of are. Um, the, the fact that we have that knowledge, once you have it, then you can't be manipulated. One of the things I recommend is a book, The Use and Abuse of Logic, How to Win Every Argument by Madsen mm. Prairie. He just nails down logical fallacies. Mm. Once you understand them, can't be manipulated by them. Oh, I must look into that. My final question for you is what are some must-read books you would recommend to people, anyone trying to think clearly, understand history, understand philosophy, any that come to mind? So much does. I'd say right first off, you know, philosophy who needs it, and you can move from that point to the rest of her work. Then you must read uh, the works of uh, Nathaniel Brandon, you know, as a kickoff point, because they'll open a lot of other doors. After that, I would recommend the works of Erich Fromm, which are so pertinent. You know, I'm thinking of stuff that's still pertinent today. His his works are very, very important. Um, boy, you know, as soon as you ask this question, it just all goes out of your head. Uh, and then I would I would dip into the, some of the books that we've talked about, you know, from the Eustace Mullins and from John Coleman. And I would start slowly getting into those works, right? Uh, and if you want to come from the media side, which I've been doing since the 70s, it is one of the oldest studies I, I undertook, helped me enormously get into all of this other stuff, right? Then I would I would start with those books. I'd brush up on, you know, the, the Brian Wilson Key, uh, Subliminal sub, subliminal Seduction, and Age of Manipulation, right? The, the ones that he did. And move in that direction into your Douglas Roshkoff's because this involves MTV, you know, things that are familiar to and palpable that you can help your kids and your neighbors with as well. A little bit less of the esoteric, because I could recommend a lot of books, but they take you off into psychology and philosophy. And that's, we know that's only a very small demographic. So yeah, there's a lot of great books out there from these conspiracy writers, which are really compulsive reading. And and many of them, the people that you, we've mentioned also talk about American history. So what could be more interesting, like Pat Buchanan did and others have done. And again, if you go to my blog and type in MSAR book list, Right, you'll get the three for the three last years. Use that as a base, because I'm I'm mentioning not only writers from way back, but those are those lists really have contemporary writers on it as well, right? So so try those. I think it's a really really good start. And I made those book lists because I get I get questions like this, and so it's so difficult to you know to 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 do, and also people don't have a lot of time to read, so. I try to hone the ones that I think would be the most palatable and also the ones that give my audience the teeth then to do what I'm doing, which is go out to the next person and say, no, I'll shoot that down, mate. Right. So there's great writers, like you said, Neil Postman, Alan Bloom, but their work tends to be complex and intellectual. OK, love it. But, you know, can we can we soften it a bit? And I've done that. I've gone to I've gone to enlisted books that anybody can read. You can download them and Kindle. They come from all sorts of sources and works, you know walks of life, the authors, and they also contain the material that you can, you know, immediately turn to some nutball that you're dealing with and 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 win the argument, shoot them down right there. And that, that gives you confidence as a reader and also as a person interacting with society today. Uh, it, I think it's much more palatable than some intellectual understanding, valuable as that is. You know, I like to see my audience having the teeth to go out there and go, no, no, that's absolutely not true. Let me cite you a source or let me, let's talk about it and win the argument. That's vital today since everybody wants to be doing that in the political arena, then do it and win. You know, that part of me says then, okay, go. It's not my way of doing things, but obviously everybody else would, would love to do it. So then they should know about these wonderful books and they should be able to, you know, glean some very, very powerful quotes from these great thinkers. And also my real agenda is keep those thinkers' names alive. You know, Ayn Rand isn't with us right now, Nathaniel Brandon. So if you're reading their books, it's great because I know you're going to go out there and write lyrics. I know you're going to write poetry. I know you're going to probably write your own book tomorrow and those people's names. See, there's only two motives in my life. It's why I haven't advertised a lot. And they really are simple to understand. One is to keep the lives, keep the reputations and the names and the memory of the, the scholars we've talked about alive, the ones who passed away. And the other one is, you know, uh, yeah, the cries of the dead. You know, I don't, I don't sleep well. I hear the cries of my brothers and sisters from previous ages. Why, why, why? Won't somebody tell me why I'm dying in, in the mines or in the fields of Passchendaele, right? 
yeah. You know, so I'm not too worried about humanity right now. I got other agendas, and it's only as a derivative thing, you know, that uh, my concern is with uh, modern times and modern people and, and, and shaking the sawdust out of their ears. You know, it, it's not my primary focus, but it, but it is a focus, right? But it's a derivative one. Well, Mr. Tessarion, thank you for uh, <laughs> spending two hours with me. It was uh, very informative. In the description below, you will see uh, not only links to unslavedmichaeltessarion.com, you'll also see the three links to his uh, archived book list from 2018, 2019, and oh, okay. 2020. Uh, I want to finish with this quote. In order to rally people, governments need enemies they want us to be afraid to hate so we will rally behind them and if they do not have a real enemy they will invent one in order to mobilize us thank you for watching keith knight don't tread on anyone mr tesarion thank you for your time welcome keith is the best interview anybody's ever given me so kudos to that mate we'll talk again thank you